And welcome everybody to Singularity U Australia, a Future by Design salon series. We present these free live salons every week. You can also subscribe to our free podcast, Inspire for Five. Have a look at our digital online programs, uh, check out the website and make sure you have a look at the summit that's upcoming in three weeks today. Today we are fortunate, really excited to talk to Gemma Acton, who is a finance expert within the National 7 News team. She regularly features across all the network's news programs and she also fills in as presenter on Weekend Sunrise. So there's some very early starts there for Gemma. <laughs> Gemma, welcome and thank you for joining us today. It is my pleasure and always enjoy doing things and looking at the future and how the world's changing so quickly. And that, as you correctly noticed, Christina, journalism is is far from left out of that, that paradigm. Yeah, so let's go straight into it then. How has journalism changed? Exponential tech taken over so many aspects of our lives. I don't think people quite realise the effect that exponential technology has had on journalism. Yeah, I think the, the biggest change is the fact that we can get uh, news 24 hours a day wherever we are. If you think back you know, sort of 70 years or even probably 50 years, we were getting one newspaper a day pretty much, generally the morning newspaper, sometimes an evening newspaper as well, and the 6 p.m. news. And so really we are just expected to deliver so much more content, which I don't think is necessarily a great result for um, either viewers or for, for journalists. Um, for viewers, because you just get saturated. I think you know, we, we, we all, as, as a consumer myself, like stepping out away from being a journalist for a moment, um, you know, there's only so many times a day you need to read really minor updates on a situation. Um, and as a journalist, it, it's just an, an incredible amount of pressure to keep producing new, interesting content uh, and keep ahead of everything. I think it's um, a necessary consequence of that, that um, quality does slip a little if you're producing one story a day. It's very different to, to having to churn out 12 stories a day, which is, which is realistic. Um, and I, I think a, a point I'm sure we'll go on to is just the money that's that seeped out of the, the industry in, in the last couple of decades has, has been extraordinary. And um, some of that is not, not a bad thing. There's certainly tremendous amount of wastage in years gone by in journalism. Journalists um, lived very sort of comfortable, cushy lives, uh, which is certainly not the case for most journalists today. Um, but there, there, there's also come a point in recent years where the, the amount of, of of money now in journalism makes it very difficult for, for a lot of people to have the resources to to do a fantastic job. So let, let's go straight into that then because there has been some controversy lately with the Facebook and the Google paying for news etc um, and you're saying uh, like giving a financial perspective from from a different point of view as well Do, can you explain to to viewers how that actually works because I know a lot of the times a lot of the conversations, and we'll make this a separate question later, but a lot of the, the conversations are around, you know, journos just need to sensationalise stuff and to pull readers in so that there's all that rhetoric, but that is tied to the financial consequences of what goes on. So can you just shed some light on how that actually works? Because yeah, it's, I'm sure, it's sure. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty easy to measure um, how engaged audiences are so if you're writing um, articles you can look at how many clicks you've got how long people stay on a story how long people stay on a video uh, if you're in television you can check the ratings uh, and these correlate pretty well back to advertising so we do really really care still about the ratings and we, and we do people look at every program every day there's you know meetings in the morning going through what worked what didn't work should we put the ad break earlier different um, states around Australia have different timings for different programs someone might want to, you know, Melbourne might want to see the AFL at a certain time, not relevant in certain other states. So um, it, it really, really matters. And as we're all aware, sadly, that has um, caused a bit of a clickbait culture where you do put a sensational headline up because you do need to get those clicks. Uh, I hope and I feel that in some ways we're, as consumers, getting smarter about clickbait. So we know if there's a sensational headline, it's probably not going to be um, the story that it promises, just as when we look at a lot of trashy magazines, if it says something like Harry Megan split on the front, we know it's probably not true. Um, but with regards to the money, I, yeah, I'm sure we will come to Google and Facebook specifically, but as an example of how that, that changes our lives. So as, as, a, as, as someone whose primary program is the 6 p.m. news, I think if I went back sort of 10, 15 years, I, that's probably really all I would have to do is to create one 80 second package for the 6pm news and I would have had the support of a producer 
quite a lot of time to get into the story, understand the story, find the best possible talent, um, you know, cameramen, sound guys, um, more attention and more money from wardrobe and makeup. And these days we're just doing things on a shoestring. I, I, it's no exaggeration to say I probably do do about um, 12 pieces a day now. Um, my producer will be working on three different stories. They could be completely separate, like a finance one and a crime one and a politics one. Um, so it's very hard for, for him or her to keep switching from one mindset to the next. There's fewer editors around. So to obviously everything does get checked. And I want to be very clear about that. Um, nothing goes to where that hasn't been checked, but um, it's still, there's just fewer editors around and they're all more time pressure, more time constrained as well. So inevitably just like anything when, when you're rushed and under pressure and you're, you're you're forced to do a lot more with a lot less um you know pr products can slip um and I, I i think given that that actually we do manage to put out a, a very good product and everyone if you saw how fast and furious people work here and, and how proud they are of the output i just think around the newsroom and um you know journalists are proud of the work they do producers proud of the work they do um i think there probably be a bit more sympathy because there's Absolutely, a, 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 a tendency to criticise the mainstream media, um, some of which is validated, but I, I think there's a lot of what we are doing is responding to what audiences want. You know, audiences click on clickbait, sadly, so that's what we give them. Audiences want really short packages because the attention spans, are, we, we see how long people watch videos for, it's generally less than 80 seconds, which is the average length of a news story. So we are delivering what, what's wanted, but then it's kind of a vicious cycle because it's not necessarily the best way to get into the, the depths of a, of, of a subject matter. I've, I've, I have a history um, in news. I used to work in a newsroom, so I very much relate to what you're saying. Uh, but also I, I watched you as you, uh, as you reported um, on the Summit Media launch and you were so thorough in the conversations that you had um, with everybody and you were very particular about the, the shots that you were setting up to engage to engage people in what we were trying to engage people in. And, and it was a three hour, I'm sure you were there for three hours. Um, and then to have to write the story and to produce it and to know that that was only one version of that story that you produced that day was quite um, quite a remarkable thing to watch. So, and, and I would really love um, our audience to understand the depths that you go in your research. Can you share, like, I know that you didn't just turn up on, on the day that we did the media launch. What, what is the depth of research that a journalist will go into um, to, to decide to do a story and then, then the hours that are required to put into that story to make it a really good story? Yeah, thanks, Christina, for acknowledging that. I mean, that, that day that I was there with you, I think I left at 3.30 and then we had to have something ready for the 4 p.m. news. So it meant I had to get a really good grip on the story before I got back to the newsroom because I really had 40 minutes or so to go through, find the, the grabs I wanted from the sort of five or six interviews that I did, all the footage that we put together, make sure the editor understood what, what we needed. And so a lot, of, a lot of the research is to make sure that we as journalists are, are ready to go straight away. If someone had asked me to get up and do you know, a live cross, which happens sometimes as well when you're looking at a story, uh, where you're just ad-libbing um, you just need to be very very familiar with it um, so I, I think the, the the most of us read things continuously like I, even if I'm not doing it so for a good example today interest rates day the reserve bank will make a decision even if I hadn't read anything today I've been reading enough for the last month and the last three years that I've been back in Australia um, to make sure I am ready to go so there is a lot of um, assumed knowledge that it is your responsibility as a journalist to just keep updating. It's the same with our crime reporters. They just need to keep on top of uh, everything that's happening with regards to crime. And, and I can honestly tell you, when you get home after a day in a, in a frantic news, and the last thing you want to do is read any more news or watch any more news. Um, but that unfortunately is just, um, you know, it's like our homework. You, you just do need to, to, to be on top of developments as they happen quickly. Television is a little different insofar as it's um, visually led. So um, sometimes there'll be the most interesting story in the world in a newspaper, and it's a story I'd love to cover, and I you know, really like everyone involved, and I think it's an important one for our audiences to, to um, know about. But if we can't bring it to life through visuals, people switch off. And as I said, we, we, we can track the ratings minute by minute, no exaggeration. So we can see when people turn on, turn off, change the channel. And so... Um, we've got to have gripping visuals. So sometimes when people pitch to me, the, and, I, and I had this conversation with, with, with your team at, at Singularity as well, I was like, look, I, I love all this advanced tech stuff. I, 
and I understand the story behind, it, I understand how it's going to change our lives in you know ten years and how you know the for an, I'll give you an example like you know the the microbiome is going to and how our gut health is so important and that's a really interesting conversation to have around the dinner table. But if I can't show that, if I can't show some sort of example of how the microbiome, that's a tough one. Like, what are we going to show? So we're so reliant on um, people uh, thinking through that and thinking, oh, here's a good way to explain. So what we did at Singularity Year that day was start off with um, bananas. I think we all had the example of, you know, you put your fruit together in a fruit bowl and some of them go off really quickly. I don't even relate to like, what I bought my bananas yesterday. Why are they already off? The answer is, is because they're sitting there with onions, which emit this, um, this, this type of chemical that causes them to ripen so much more quickly. So that's something that it's visual. It's a banana, it's an onion, it's a fruit bowl. And it's something that we can all understand and say, oh, I care because I have a kitchen and I've got a fruit bowl there. And the, the primary question we have to answer every single time before we take on a story is why would my audience care? Why does this matter to them? Um, and sometimes it's really obvious why they'd care. Sometimes it's just pure gratuity. Like I, I think many of us have probably been following the Melissa Caddick story. Like the, we're all riveted by that, obviously. It's just, just a fascinating story. But sometimes it's things that are really dry, like home loan rates. But, you know, if it's going to save you $800 a month, then you care. So it's just finding things that matter to the audience. So there's so many questions I want to ask you out of, out of everything that you just said. One is how you got into journalism in the first place, yeah. because you've been in Australia for three years. Um, but I'm going to go with the first question, and then let's go into your history. Um, exponential tech is taking over more and more and more. A lot of that is software. So how do you, I mean, you did, I, I think, but I'm totally biased, um, you did a great job of actually showing the technology through the images, even as you say, you know, the, the banana with, um, with post-harvest. But how do you... How do you go about knowing, and I know you kind of answered this question just now, but with exponential tech, it's really difficult sometimes to show the visual unless you're showing the end result. And Rowan had the, the machine there that had all the software behind it with Tech Gym um, and, you know, the, the straight rehabilitation and the story behind his grandmother is pretty awesome. How do you, how do you um, invent, I guess it's that whole creativity, which is why you're into journalism, that helps you visualise something that isn't so visual when you, as you say, there's times when you know it, it may not be the best visuals, um, but it's a really good story and you care, so you want people to know. I, I think this is something that you learn on the job. Uh, the cameramen are incredibly talented and good at what they do and they will be able to film things in a way, they'll just be standing there with the camera looking at something and you won't think they've done anything tricky and you get back and you watch the footage on your computer and you think, wow, they've, they've seen this product and managed to shoot it from a certain angle or in contrast or juxtaposition for something behind it. And they've made this gripping. And, and as you do this job for longer and longer, you notice these things more and more and opportunities for, for quirky um, visuals around you. And, and sadly, I just think it's a reality of modern life that we're sort of deadened to a lot of that. You don't notice things until they're pointed out to you. And this is all of us. And I, I think an, an example of it, I, I've just been watching The Queen's Gambit with my boyfriend who has nothing to do with media. And I loved it. One of the reasons I loved it was because every every scene was so beautifully shot. You know, the framing of, of, of the interior of the house and um, her outfits everything about it was so precisely done and that just um, made me think it was beautiful and so I enjoyed the story so much more. Jack, my boyfriend, wouldn't have had a clue about the visuals. We actually talked about it. He's just like, oh, was it nicely shot? But he enjoyed it a lot as well. And I think it's subconsciously he enjoyed it because it was so beautiful to look at. It was one of the reasons he enjoyed it. But the average person wouldn't be alert to that. So um, in my position, I'm heavily dependent on the cameraman in, in, in identifying these quirky things. And an example at Singularity Year, my cameraman, in addition to his massive camera, brought along a, a little GoPro. So he's doing really clever things, like putting it inside. There was a pair of, sort of binocular things, um, a, a bit like a kaleidoscope. He was putting the, the camera inside of that to see through the lenses, like just trying to find ways that um, audiences can look and say, whoa, that's a cool shot. Whoa, that looks, that looks great. So yeah, you're continuously thinking about it. And I think um, uh, uh, that's one of the, the toughest and also the most exciting things about being a journalist today. Like we do have less attention span from viewers and audiences. So we do have to be that much more creative and you can't tell an interest rate story by getting up there and saying today the Reserve Bank didn't cut interest rates. You have to start off, you know, in someone's house, someone in the kitchen. You just have to 
think about ways to, to grab people and bring them in. So storytelling is such a, a critical part, part of the job these days. Uh, that it does it adds to the narrative right? when you make it when you add that human element to it. Um, how did you get into journalism? What's your history with that? Do we, you know, was it from, like, from the beginning? Yeah. So when I was about sixteen, I um. I did an internship at SBS on the radio and I was actually living in Melbourne at the time and it was the week that they brought in the smoking ban, which we thought was just the most extraordinarily exciting thing ever in so far as it just seemed so out there to have a smoking ban. Uh, obviously now it just seems unbelievable that we just used to freely smoke in restaurants and aeroplanes and everything else. And so that was great. So I worked with a really great girl who was called Emily. She's now at the ABC. I actually should reach out and thank her for, for helping me so much. But she actually let me put together a story and air it, which is pretty extraordinary when you're, when you're 16 and, and doing work experience. And, and then when I went to London, I went there for university when I was 18. And I just needed money because I, I my fees were really expensive because I was a foreign student. And um, you know, I, I couldn't get a student loan because you had to be uh, English to, to get it. And... Um, I got offered or I sort of sort of applied for um, an unpaid one month internship at CNBC, which is financial television. And I did it and it went really well. And at the end, they said, look, could you come in in the mornings and work here as a paid freelancer? So I ended up doing from 4am to midday at CNBC, producing their breakfast show and then going to university in the afternoon from, from 12 to 5 Um for a couple of years. Uh, so that was a, a great entree into it. And then I went into finance for about 12 years. So I worked at Goldman Sachs, Pinfo, various things doing and did an MBA at Wharton, um, private wealth management, investment banking. And then for various reasons, I was just, just wasn't enjoying it. Got really stressed about my job. Didn't like my last team having had a good decade before in finance. And so I just needed time out. I went, called my boss from CNBC who I hadn't seen since I was 21 at this stage, I was 33. And said, hi, John, I don't know if you remember me. He's like, yeah. I said, could I come back? He's like, sure, see you four o'clock on Monday morning. <laughs> and there I was, um, having had this pretty wild, exciting, you know, high-flying financial career in New York, Dubai, Milan, London, et cetera back literally at my desk where I'd been an 18 year old intern a couple of years earlier but then things happened quite quickly because I was financial tv and I had a lot of financial experience um I got on air quite quickly reporting then started presenting uh and then moved home and luckily seven needed a finance presenter around the time I moved home so I got this job so what is it about journalism that excites you the most is it is it talking to people is it letting sharing the stories of the unknown what is it yeah, good question. And um, I think you're always at the forefront of what's happening. So whatever breaks on the front page of the news, you're either speaking to the person yourself, which is just the most incredibly privileged access, or you are um, sitting next to a colleague who's speaking to that person yourself. So for me, a lot of my, my stuff is around business and finance. But, you know, last week getting to speak to the CEO of Afterpay and Commonwealth Bank and Jerry Harvey, just like all, all in a day, that's that's just incredible access. And like for all the complaints people have about Jerry Harvey, you know, he is still a retail titan. Like he has an extraordinary story. He's been retailing in Australia since the 1950s, gone from nothing to being a, a, a billionaire a couple of times over. So to have 30 minutes to sit down with him and just chat about like, so what was retailing like in the 60s? What has changed? Like that is such an exciting thing to do on any given day at work. And um, so th there's definitely that element of, 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 you know, being curious and being close to the, the stories and the people who, who make them. Um, but then there's also I, one of the reasons I left finance is I just didn't feel good about what I was doing. I was managing money for very wealthy people and just making them richer. And I just one day I just thought, come on, Gemma, you know, you were given more opportunities in life. There's more you can do. And, and not to pretend in any way I'm, I'm, I'm saving the world. Um, but you know, if I can explain to people, this is how the share market works. This is how interest rates work. You should keep an eye on, this is what a Bitcoin is. Like, you know, if you can make people understand a little bit more and to give them a little more confidence around household finances and just themselves and their own intelligence levels. Because a lot of people can get this. I've just never been exposed to it. Um, I, you know, I just feel, you know, a bit better uh, going about my day if, if I can do that. I think that's wonderful and it fits right in actually with the with the theme of the summit unleash your superpower so and, and <laughs> very big on it doesn't matter if you affect one person because that one person will have a ripple effect and affect so many others I think what what you're doing um, in that regard is wonderful and I wish people would understand um, that that ethos and that ethic behind journalism 
uh, more because people are so quick sometimes to, to slam journalism. So let's go um, all, the, all the headlines and the sensationalism in social media around fake news. How does that affect you um, and what is it to you? What is fake news to you? Yeah, this, is a, this has done journalism a tremendous disservice and also a tremendous disservice to um, audiences as well because it is harder to, to tell what's real and what's fake and there's widely an, an assumption that um, a lot of stories out there are fake, like there's a much higher bar to clear. And what you get as a result of that is people just becoming more and more cautious about saying anything because they you know they're going to worry they're going to be accused of play, um, fake news and so you get to the point where messages are so incredibly diluted that it's actually not that uh, helpful and yeah I, I, I think it's really sad I think it was started by the wrong people and it gets to the point where it's the the boy who cries wolf and so far as if you hear fake news fake news fake news the whole time when there actually is fake news you don't know what is and what isn't if there was um more respect uh, for the journalistic work that gets put out there, then if there is a really bad, inaccurate article written or a really bad, inaccurate story on the news, and that's the one thing that gets called out that day is, look, that is fake, that is terrible, that is way too opinionated, you can't back that up, then people would pay a lot more attention to it. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a bit sad. I think it also benefits extremism often you'll get people saying this is fake news but they won't actually say why it's just a really easy slanderous uh, accusation to, to throw around uh, which is a bit of a shame yeah I think um so often now also we find that there's opinion and there's journalism how do you how do you differentiate I know you're very much journalism you're you're on the seven news team um how do you find it when opinion starts coming in when people go oh that that you know this broadcast is um, is you know left this broadcast right how do you deal with all of that and how do you how does that work in the world of journalism yeah look i i think there's definitely a place for both there's a place for um factual analysis and there's a place for opinion but they should be very very clearly labeled labeled as such so uh any and, and places have got better about doing this certainly newspapers are better often say about opinion um or analysis uh or explainer and i think these terms are are very necessary because I, I mean, I, I would call myself a very centrist in terms of my, my political views, um, you know, centre-left if anything, um, but I really appreciate reading really far-right extreme views because I need to understand the other side of the argument. So I don't think it's a waste of my time at all to read, you know, a, a very far-right view to see if there's anything I can take away from it, if there's any Thing I haven't considered if there's any way I need to readjust my own um, beliefs and assumptions. So I would actually find that more valuable to myself than reading someone who agrees with me. Um, but it's just important to know what it is when you're getting into it because you know I've been doing I've been in finance now for 21 years and I'm pretty confident with what's real and what's not. But for someone starting out, it's very hard for them to to discern what what's real and what's what's opinion. I think it would be wonderful if we could actually have the two sides and have the debate like they did, you know, back in ancient Greece, maybe even. Um, but to, to be respectful, as you're saying, you want to know because you want to get the full picture um, and then to be able to agree to disagree to. And, and I think that's part of the beauty of, um, of journalism as well is giving you the facts and then prompting you if you're interested in something to research. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, there's actually a really good... Uh, I can't remember if it's an app or a website, but um, where you, I think it's literally called changemymind.com or something like that, and where you go on and you intentionally go into battle with someone who believes the exact opposite and, and they sort of have to try and convince you and you try and convince them. Uh, but I think this is very healthy, just making you um, empathise and sympathise. And one of the tragedies I think of these, you know, bit-sized bits of news we get on social media is that you, you don't, always read the full picture or you don't you, you just choose the ones you want to read which doesn't really help us you know expand our minds or our, or our empathy 
so how do you find like the effect that technology now has had on journalism? So we've talked about your reporting on exponential tech, etc. The effect that um, that technology has had on journalism, as in now we stream more, um, the, you know, the, the ability to actually play specific news stories into specific areas where they're more relevant, but also the downsizing of broadcast rooms, newsrooms, etc. Um, how has that affected um, you potentially personally and the, and your colleagues uh, and what are you seeing so if you could just give us a, a bit of a broad history over the last maybe 10, 10 5 to 10 years of, of how tech has affected how journalism itself is produced and so the, let me start with the bright side the bright side is is that you get much more access so in, information is much more timely and relevant uh, twitter for all its faults is an incredible source of breaking news so even if I'm 10 minutes out from going to air or five, two minutes out from going to air, um, I can be on air and like all wired up microphone ready to go and something develops and we can get that information to you straight away. And we are like that. Like we, we are updating literally until the last second. There's no sort of finishing at 5.30 before 6 p.m. news and going home. It's, it's, it's active and dynamic throughout the, the show. So that's obviously a, a huge upside, you know, the potential for people to take incredible footage on their phones when they're at the scene of something where previously... They wouldn't have had the resources to do that. So um, we as audiences can get a lot closer to the real story. Um, the, the obvious downside is just how overwhelming it is. One of my best producers went on maternity leave just over two years ago, came back a couple of weeks ago and was just overwhelmed even in that two years by how much more frenetic the pace has become. And she said, I, I just can't believe how much, you know, it's changed, like how much more we're expected to do. Um, and that's not a by any means a criticism against seven that's just responding to you know every time we put we put a new show out there whether it's a, a you know a, a show that seven's especially created for facebook or it's a, another new show we didn't have the 4pm news until a couple of years ago so every time we put something out people watch it people listen to it people read it so there is this desire to keep putting more and more and more out um so that that's uh, been a bit difficult i i think um also i Again, like to my point about hearing different views, I think it's so, so important to have, aside from, you know, the, the, the biggest news and, and TV sources, other ones like I, you know, the Saturday paper, the New Daily, I think these are just such a, a fantastic source of, of looking at different angles and, and, and reading different, different things you hadn't thought about. Um, but um, in addition to having those ones, and easier access to those, you also get, you know, a, a lot of, tripe as well um and a lot of people sounding their own horn and 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 without much um to say so it's, it's difficult to to sort through it all and and figure out what's what's worth reading and what's not but I, the, the best thing about technology is probably the fact that it has given you know if, if i couldn't get new daily articles on my computer i don't know if, if i would have ever gone out and if, if it had been a time if it had been launched at a time when it, you had to buy a physical paper i probably wouldn't have gone out and bought the physical paper but i do always really appreciate their take on, on on stories I'm looking at. Do you think there's been a big cross over or, or a more of a melding between print um, print and broadcast media? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, I think w when Nine and Fairfax merged, that was a very, and they've got the radio as well, that was a very clear sign. And I think that's actually a, not a bad thing at all. I think um, certain stories are better told through audio, certain stories are better told visually, certain stories are better read. So having um, a combination, I think, is, is actually a really good thing. And once you've researched a story, you can deliver it in any format. So, I mean, you should be able to if you're a good journalist. So it's actually a, a really good use of resources. Like I, I don't actually write for Seven, but I've written in the past for, for various newspapers. Um, the only reason I don't write at the moment is I just literally don't have time. But um, it it's not that hard to once you've done all your research if I do live process for tv packages for tv if I do a jump on the radio and talk to someone about it if I churn out a quick article it's the, the definitely to your earlier point the time consuming element is in the research and I think also that um, people don't realize now that there's a lot of journalists that are that are um, editing their own stories you know sitting down as you said with cameramen your your camera the angles etc that as you as you said earlier um, that that came out of that story uh, from the from the launch were quite remarkable and it is uh, one thing that struck me so I've, I've worked in um, documentary and um, advertising and news and people I don't, I don't think to your point earlier the beauty of the shot 
and the skill that a news cameraman has um, as opposed to, to a cinematographer who has their own particular skill. It's all beautiful. Uh, but now I think those, the, the blurring of the lines and the video that comes with the print broadcast and the, you know, the, we've got to put content out on, on Facebook. It is that never ending uh, ability to produce that you do have. But can I ask you, what was your favorite? What's or not favorite? Because I think that's, that's probably too hard a question. What's a standout, a standout um, story that you did? Oh gosh, I wish I'd been prepared for that question. I'm sure I would have come back to the far better answer. And I'm not just saying this because this is your your, your webcast, uh, Christina, but I've always really enjoyed the tech stuff because, and they always rate really, really well. So you can get like, trapped in your, all of us in our jobs, in your own little daily bubble of, you know, news, um, you know, when's my makeup call? What time's my interview with whoever? Um, so stepping out and looking at people who are taking a much longer term view at the world and really, uh, doing things that are just so tremendously exciting. I remember one year um, at, at one of the tech conferences, there was the uh, Deloitte was there and they were doing remapping transport systems, so solving traffic, uh, which again, like we don't think about how annoying it is. Well, we, we do, but we don't think of who's actually trying to make the, the traffic grid better for us. But seeing that people come to work every single day and use incredible, you know, drones and algorithms and all the rest of it to try and figure out the best ways to run a city. Like that, that sort of thing is 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 always so exciting. Um, in terms of uh, the other part of my job, which is um, the sort of you know the more financy side, it, I do find it, regardless of what I think of the individual and what regardless of what I think of the company, I do find it a privilege to sit down with with really high powered people and just see how they tick you know like if you think they've done a terrible job of running you know, a certain company that may be it but they've somehow managed to to get up through the chain of you know a multi-thousand person organization to run it which is they've got to be doing something right you know they've got to convince some people that they're that they're worthwhile so just um trying to understand um you know, what what makes them special and how do they do things differently to get to this position of, of you know, power and importance that, that we can all learn from and, and tie into our lives. I think also the fact that journalism, particularly lately, I think, has shown um, human factors of people. Yes. You say, you know, you sat down with Jerry Harvey the other day. He is clearly an incredible, um, incredible source of knowledge and source of history and an amazing businessman, uh, but very interested from a technology perspective um, the differences that maybe he did share with you from retail back in the 60s to retail. Have you got any, any bits that you can share with us? Yeah, so he he's basically talked about the fact that it's just such a throwaway world. Um, so he said back in the sort of 60s, he would be taking a fridge and making it all better again and, and selling it. He said, there's no way I could sell a secondhand fridge today. He said, but back then people would would were just sort of happy with, you know, it, it's good enough. Um, he said the bar was a lot lower for what people expected. Um, I mean, that said, I actually do have a second hand fridge, but I think I'm probably quite alone in that. Um, but um, he, yeah, he, that, that was one of the, the key points he made is that people just expect new and nice. And if it means thrown away, so be it. And I said, do you think that'll change with the fact we're becoming more conscious about recycling? Because I actually did. Um, do most of my house through Facebook Marketplace and Gumtree and um, partly it was because it was more cost effective but also partly because there are some really cool things that look really different to the sort of standard boring stuff you can get in shops these days and so a lot of very specific pieces that I had in mind from you know maybe a tv show I saw I could only find because they were from you know 60s pieces from going on on these sites so um, but part of it is also an environmental fact and he, he doesn't really think people are really um, as committed to environmental change as they say they are, which is an interesting point. I, I think they are. Like, I'm definitely much more conscious personally. I know a lot, a lot of my, my friends are as well. Um, and one of the other, really other interesting things he said was he's like, look, online sales have been fantastic for us. But if last year proved anything to us, it was just how important the physical showroom is. And he said, so we're going the other way to most companies and we're building ours out. He's like, it's really hard to get land now to do it, to get new ones. He said, but we're expanding, I think, about half of them um, and just making, like, pouring a lot more money into making them special. He said, because it should go back to the old days where um, 
you know, it was, a, it was a sort of like a fun experience to go to a fabulous showroom and wander around for half a day and look at all the things you could buy and put together a shopping list, um, which is quite interesting because it, it sort of speaks to what he sees as retail cycles rather than as um, one way, one way change. I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting. And, and the way that tech has affected um, retail too. I remember walking into a, into a, um, Desiguar shop in Spain and seeing a hologram of a tiger about to pounce out. <laughs> uh, and as you said, I just picked up on that word, word experience. You know, it's the experience that you have going in there. Uh, and so much focused on the user experience and customer service. Uh, and so let's bring that back to, back to um, journalism. With user experience, how do you, how do you as, a, as a broadcaster, what kind of research would the broadcaster do? I know we talked about, um, you know, we watch the the, um, the ratings and, and how long people are watching um, different different pieces and how long they're reading pages for. Uh, but how do you actually select which areas of journalism um, that will be a highlighted, I guess, on, on a news story, but but where your your channel, your broadcaster, actually wants to focus. Yeah, and I, again, it's 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 largely a response from audiences. So not just in terms of actual numbers, but some stories generate a lot of chatter, and so they they tend to be the ones that you know, people talk about. I mean, I, a bizarre example, like astonishingly, the most popular story I did for years was when the price of roast chickens in Woolworths went from eight dollars to nine dollars. Um, it was watched so much, but I, I think um, the average Australian family eats um, chicken four days a week. So it does actually make a difference to, to, to household budgets. But um, I remember one of my friends calling me and saying, oh, I dropped in to see my godmother and she's having a ladies lunch with 12 people. And they were all talking about, you, you know, your, your package last week. And in terms of sort of responses back and forth online, it, the, the, the debate went for literally for days. And um, so you do want uh, things that are talking points. Um, and it's also about balance. So uh, again, like I, I think people wouldn't, when you sit down and watch the news you probably think it's quite you might think it's quite random the order in which stories appear in and how what gets 30 seconds what gets 20 seconds what, what gets a minute 20 um it's far from random like the whole day long the executive producer is calculating what should go next to this well if that's that long then that should be there which journalist here and which so the, the whole thing is I don't exaggerate when I say it's done to the last second. There's a counter in the corner and the show has to run to exactly one hour, not a second more, not a second less. And that's because of obligations we had to advertisers apart from anything else. Um, so it's very, very precise art about um, how different stories complement and, and balance each other out. Now, I, I spent a very long time in London um, where the news is very different. It's very outward looking. It's very global, very concerned about what's happening in Europe. I was really surprised when I got back here how uh, insular the news is. Um, it's, it's very similar to what you get in a lot of the US. Um, so I, I personally would like it to be a bit, bit more outward looking. I personally think people can learn a lot from what's happening overseas. Um, but our EPs are responding to what audiences turn on and turn off. So it's, it's, apparently not not what a lot of other people want to see um so you just triggered an, another question that i'd love to ask you, um, <laughs> with the with the looking up bitcoin has been in the news a lot lately uh and um you know the, the share market and it's up and it's down and it's everything else and and you mentioned earlier cryptocurrency and, and reporting on things like that um what are your thoughts on crypto bitcoin where do you think it's going to go um, yeah it's really interesting. So I, I've never bought into Bitcoin historically. Um, my sister bought quite a lot a long time ago, which is great for her. <laughs> um, but I didn't trust it enough. For me, it's always been a trust issue that I you know, didn't, wasn't confident I wasn't going to get scammed, hacked, uh, et cetera. Um, I actually will buy some soon. I probably wait till there's, we've had a little bit of a price correction in the last week or so, but I probably wait till there's a bit more of a price correction. I've got to the point now where I think there's enough serious institutions looking at it um, and individuals, like, you know, big, prominent, multi-decade investors with a stunning track record, that it's a bet worth taking. So, I mean, obviously choose the right platform to do it through and choose the right digital wallet and that sort of thing. Um, but 
I think I, I caught up with some guys who founded the first Bitcoin exchange in Australia last week. So they founded that back in 2012, which is long before many of us had even heard of Bitcoin. And they said that the pitch they give to fund managers um, is a, a, a good investment portfolio. So, you, you know, you allocate a certain amount to the share market, a certain amount to bonds, a certain amount to gold or whatever else you want to buy, should have one to three percent in it. And that didn't actually sound wild to me. Like it sounds like a pretty small part of your overall savings. But if the price keeps going up, which I think is actually really feasible, um, you know, it's a good thing to, to have there to watch it go up. And if it plummets, well, you've still got you know, 97 to 99% of your, your money and other stuff. Uh, as a practical asset, I don't think it's going to be that useful for a long time. Transaction costs are still too high and they don't really have a good answer for when they're going to be coming down. So I'm not sure how, how imminently practical it is, but I, I think it's not a, a, a stupid thing to just have a small allocation to. That's, that's how I feel about it anyway. It feels like it's kind of coming into its own now. We, we talk about things yeah. being going through a deceptive phase and then all of a sudden they become much more um, popular, much more democratised, and it, it feels that that's what's happening now. The banks are kind of going, oh, hey, maybe we need to have a look at, at this yeah. and take it a little bit more seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it'd be interesting to follow uh, the stories uh, around Bitcoin. Do you actually, think well, actually... one, one last thing to say on that is every night I do a little... Um, a little finance update really quick 40 seconds just go through this what happened on the share market today these are the big movers this is oil this is gold this is what's happening in the aussie dollar and in the last week i've had a barrage of requests to add in bitcoin to my little update uh, which i thought was really interesting sort of side of the times type stuff so i'm not going to do it right yet because we might see what we saw in 2017 which was this you know big russian enthusiasm it went from you know, basically two thousand dollars to twenty five thousand dollars and then plummeted the next few weeks back down to below 8,000. Um, this is all in Aussie dollars I'm talking. Uh, so, you know, we might see that again in like radio silence out of Bitcoin for the next two and a half years. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's, if it, if, even if it does do that again, I think it's probably a chance it'll come back, back as well. So maybe we, we will add it in. But it's really interesting that, that that conversation has been happening over the last yeah. week. Um, okay. So we're almost out of time. I'd like to ask you if, if you could, say to people be a little more gentle i'm going to say to people be a little more <laughs> journalist and on news and you know it's not it's not all fake news and journalists i've seen them firsthand they worked really hard uh but if if you could say to somebody what your responsibility is um and how seriously it is that journalists take what they do um, can i just give you a couple of minutes um to share what your inner thoughts are because i think that's really really important to how people see journalism and how we need to have that continued respect for journalism. Oh, thank you for saying that. That's such a nice thing to, to offer because um, we, we don't always get a chance to, to say things. You know, any given morning I'll wake up and my Twitter will be full of um, all sorts of horrible things from, you know, oh, you don't understand anything about finance or um, you look horrible in yellow. So it's really nice to, to have a chance to actually say our point of view. Obviously, you can't respond to all of those, those messages and, and, and nor should you because a lot of people just want to you know, say something nasty if it makes them feel better. Um, but I, I think often I read comments, um, whether about myself or about other journalists saying, oh, they're, they're trying to make people think X, Y, and Z. I, in my experience, certainly in this newsroom, very rarely are people trying to push a certain line. If, 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 it's, if it is a bit misguided what someone's saying, it's generally out of a lack of time to do research or being thrust into a story you know, suddenly with, with, without their proper chance to prepare. But in terms of intentionally going and um, trying to manipulate people's views, that's that's something I come across extremely rare, rarely in, 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 in my own job. And, um, yeah, I, I think people always ask me, how do you know what to read or know what to watch? I, I think it actually often comes down to the journalists. Like you do have quite a lot of uh, autonomy. You know, you do have a producer who works with you. You do have the executive producer who signs off on everything. You have the chief of staff who assigns you in the first place. But... You do have quite a lot of autonomy in terms of um, how you tell a story, like 80 seconds. You know, there were, let's take Singularity U. There was so much. that like, I could have put together a three-hour special on that. I put together an 80-second piece. So some discretion in terms of what goes in and what goes out. Um, but find a journalist you, you like and you trust. You know, I'm sure we all have our favourite authors in newspapers and you know, hopefully favourite reporters on TV as well. And choose someone you, you, you believe because going into everything thinking, oh, this could be fake news, this could be untrue. It's just 
a real waste of your time. Like if you if you find people you can you know get behind and and trust. It's same as politicians. There's some we believe more than others, and so you just find someone you, you, you or find you know a few that that you think are going to deliver you reliable good news um, is is probably a better way to go about it. And um, yeah, no, I, let me tell you, we, we work so hard. I, um, we I, this morning I got in to do sunrise, and last thing I do tonight is the eleven thirty late news. Um, and so some of it's pre-recorded and you know that it's not quite as bad as I just made the day sound but it, it is a really long day and it's a day that never ever ever stops so I'm getting emails all day long from from PRs I'm keeping up to date on how the stories are happening I'm rushing out to do interviews I have to go to hair and makeup twice during the day um trying to set up things for the following week like it's it, it is absolutely absolutely relentless and this is meanwhile I'm about to the 11 o'clock news I'll do that for Sydney I'll do it for Adelaide do the 4 p.m. news for all the different states and Sydney. I'll do 6 p.m. news, two stories on that. Do the interest rate update at 2.30 today. Do the late news twice as well. Um, yeah, it, it's if something gets missed and I try so hard to make sure things aren't missed, it's not because I'm trying to screw anyone over or push a certain viewpoint. It's generally just because, you know, we, we're just doing our best. Um, and I think that's the same for, for most people. <laughs> Gemma, I am even more grateful. I was always grateful no. that you spent this time no, this with us. I'm even more grateful. Thank you. No, I'm more grateful now. Um, and, you know, very grateful for the support that you do give Exponential Tech. Um, and, you know, I hope to see you at the summit, but I absolutely know how busy you are. Um, but you're always welcome at anything we do, and I, I'd love to have follow-up conversations with you. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been what, what, an absolute pleasure sharing this time with you. Let me just say thank you to you because um, there is no journalism, there's no stories. So it's people, people like you and, and your colleagues and your team and everyone else out there who, who makes things happen and does interesting and exciting things that, that Australians should and, and want to know about. So uh, that's the, the, the primary source of, you know, the primary input that we need. So thank you. Thank you for that. We make a great, a great, um, <laughs> great collaboration. Thanks so much. Okay, um, have a great everybody. day. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us today on, on our Future by Design Salon series. We look forward to your company on Technologies of the Future on Friday and SUAU TV tomorrow evening. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Gemma. Look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Bye, everyone.